Well, Razorback fans, you had another great weekend when it came to the transfer portal, and the Arkansas Razorback football team is getting really big at the wide receiver position. We'll talk about that, as well as things just did not go well for the Razorbacks in Nashville. And there's a lot of reactions to that we're going to try to get to. And also, next year's football schedule is easy to me. I'm going to explain what I mean by that, and it's all going to be coming up on today's Locked on Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into Locked on Razorbacks podcast. I'm your host, John Neighbors. I'm also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 1037 The Buzz and 1037thebuzz.com. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs, where they help you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. And uh, if you're a Razorback basketball fan, I know you didn't. And we'll talk about that. Don't worry. Uh, kind of doing the whole uh, compliment sandwich. Start with something positive, go with the negative, and then go into something positive as well uh, for today's podcast. Plus, as I've noticed, uh, a lot of you are really interested more so just in football still. Even though basketball is going on, the uh, the things of what portals and, and coaching changes and all that stuff, you're still very fascinated in. So I figured I'd start with that, especially since uh, I'm recording this on Sunday and it was some really good news that Arkansas got a commitment from Tyrone Broden, who is a wide receiver transfer out of Bowling Green. Okay, so... You know that you got three wide receivers out of this transfer portal class, right? Kenny Guyton, the wide receiver coach, has done a really good job. You got Isaac Tesla, who was a highly sought after wide receiver at a Hillsdale College. You also got uh, another nice one with Andrew Armstrong, who is a guy out of Texas AM Commerce. And so now you're adding another piece, which is about what we thought would happen in the wide receiver core. But there's a big factor among all these wide receivers, at least these three where Andrew Armstrong come in, comes in at six foot four, You have Isaac Tesla, which I know there's excitement there. He comes in at six foot five, And then you have the newest commitment in Tyrone Broden, who's six foot seven. He is six foot seven, 210 pounds. And Arkansas was his ninth. Uh, this is the ninth scholarship transfer edition for the Razorbacks. And it was really interesting with Tyrone Bro, and this is all according to hogsports.com, that he took an official visit just over this weekend to Arkansas, kind of like what we talked about last week, and chose Arkansas over Oklahoma, Tennessee, and various others. Okay, I don't care who the others are. If you chose Arkansas over Oklahoma and Tennessee, it shows this is the type of high-quality player that you're getting here to Fayetteville. So you got some three nice ones, some three big ones, literally. Uh, Broden has two years of eligibility remaining, so he's not just a one-and-done player for Arkansas if he so chooses. But uh, this past year, he had 32 catches for 506 yards and seven touchdowns. Also, in the previous year, he had 36 catches for 596 and six touchdowns, and then six catches for 91 yards during the COVID season of 2020. Uh, so you're talking about a huge get for Arkansas and a guy that is really going to help out a position of need at the wide receiver uh, position. So right now, if you're just looking at the the wide receiver group and uh, who's going to be coming in, you got Tyrone Broden, Andrew Armstrong, Isaac Tesla. Those are the ones that have transferred in. You got Jaden Wilson, Bryce Stevens, Landon Rogers, Sam Mbake, Isaiah Centania, and Davion Dozier. Those are the ones that uh, are looking at as far as the depth. Now, there's a lot of names that uh, a lot of people don't know in there. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, Bryce Stevens, for instance, he's probably more known for his punt returning ability, but he's going to be a wide receiver. Sam Mbake was a, a highly coveted player coming out of high school. Uh, and I see him with Isaiah Centania, but they haven't really seen a whole lot of the field just yet. And then you have three transfers coming in as well. So that's what it's looking like. So Arkansas is still trying to uh, get some other guys as far as the transfer portal goes. They were hosting a few other ones there too. Uh, also, by the way, Marlon Crockett also was a guy who committed to Arkansas. He's a 6'4 wide receiver. But if I'm not mistaken, I think he's coming on as a preferred walk-on. Uh, but another big, uh, big able-bodied receiver. And then uh, also the Razorbacks hosted a guy in Jawan Mitchell, who is a former Tennessee and Texas linebacker, who, uh, of course, you know, started his career at Texas, then transferred to Tennessee 
and uh, entered into the portal. So Arkansas is trying to add some depth there. 6'1", 235 for him. So still making some moves there, but it looks like the wide receiver group is uh, is about exactly what uh, Arkansas wanted. And it's kind of a different thing this year, too, because now you have players that are coming in that aren't the, you know, the the big time like guys from Oklahoma or, um, you know, like, like Jaden Hazelwood was or even Matt Landers, which I know he came from Toledo. But uh, he was also had the, had the Georgia uh, uh, history there where he started his career there, too. So you kind of have a different feel where this year you're getting a lot of guys that, in my opinion, and this is not saying anything against the guys previously because I, I don't think this was the case. But you got some dudes that are coming in at the wide receiver position that are going to be extremely hungry to prove themselves. Now, does that translate into skill or execution or ability once they get on the field in the SEC, doesn't guarantee it, but I think that there is an element of guys who come in right away and are trying to prove themselves to the utmost, and I think that that's what you have with these wide receivers. You also have big targets, which I know that speed is always a great thing to have, but it seems like that's what uh, Kendall Bryles and Kenny Guyton, they've really wanted to target guys that are big wide receivers. You know, last year, Matt Landers was your best go-to wide receiver, and he was six foot five. Year before that, you had Traylon Burks, who was about six foot four, uh, who was a who was a big-bodied target. So they want big-bodied dudes, and you could tell that that was something they put emphasis on. So it would be hard pressed to think that if these three wide receivers, especially, come into Arkansas and either start right away or get involved in the rotation immediately, that KJ Jefferson is not going to have to worry about. Uh, getting outmatched when it comes to throwing up those 50-50 balls because you're going to have plenty of size there too. And what I am hoping for is not only do these some of these guys have the, the big playability, the, the go up and get it type of mentality, but I'm also hoping that these are the types of players that can really help you in red zone situations because we know that Arkansas was not good in red zone, especially once they got the closer to the goal line, essentially that they got the worse off that they would be. So uh, hopefully that some of these guys will be able to help out and take advantage of that as well. But I really like what they got. I know that uh, people will be like, well, you'd say that about anybody. Hey, to me, when I'm looking at these three wide receiver transfers, all three of them were highly coveted. They had offers to other big time schools, other SEC schools as well. And if you got like this guy with Tyrone Broden, who had offers to Oklahoma and Tennessee, you think about Isaac Tesla, who had offers to A&M and Ole Miss. And a lot of people were going after him. Like that's to me like, hey, if they're good enough to play at those programs, they're definitely good enough to play at Arkansas. And that is a huge get for them as well. So now the wide receiver group, you would think is pretty much set as far as what they're going to be doing into the portal. They may add a few more, maybe one more. Don't really know this, the situation there, but it does seem like Arkansas has what they need and has uh, at least plenty of depth there to be able to make it work as far as that goes too. So I like it. I, I like the gets. Now they got to focus on a few other really important positions, especially when it comes to um, I like the linebacker group. I know that there's guys that you like, but you still want some more depth there. Maybe some uh, more secondary players uh, if you want to add those into the mix. As I'm looking at this, kind of like the you know as far as the depth chart goes, and you're looking at uh, Al Walcott, the transfer from Baylor, being a starting safety right now, and Hudson Clark. I mean, I guess. Is he going to be your starting safety? Do you try to move him back to cornerback? Uh, maybe kind of move him all over the place. Don't really know. But maybe if you get another safety in there, uh, that could help out. But the cornerbacks I'm really happy with, with Quincy McAdoo and Dwight McLaughlin. Uh, Lorando Johnson is the guy that's from Baylor. It's also another big-time transfer, and I really like him at that nickel position. So that will be able to really help out. Uh, so, I mean, the defensive line, though, is going to be interesting because I like Landon Jackson and Eric Gregory and Cameron Ball. Those are all guys that played. Uh, a lot of snaps. Zach Williams, the same thing. Torian Carter, assuming that he'll be uh, good to go and healthy. He'll be back into the mix uh, there. And then you got Jashad Stewart and John Morgan kind of on the outside uh, there uh, at that buck position too. So the, the depth is starting to come together. And I think that uh, Sam Pittman and this staff continue to do a really good job of putting it together. We got a long way to go, as we all know, and trying to uh, get it all put together as far as how this group's going to look. But Hey, they're doing a good job, and you got to give them a lot of credit for that. Now, I've got to go from the positive to the negative because I know we got to talk about Razorback basketball 
and the loss that they took over the weekend against Vanderbilt here in just a second. But folks, as a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members that you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire the qualified candidates more efficiently by matching opening roles with people who have skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals as well. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract candidates to open jobs with targeting tours. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post company and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates that you need. It's why LinkedIn Jobs ranks among all small businesses number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so continuing on with the Locked On Razorbacks podcast, man, that was not very fun on Saturday, was it? Arkansas with the uh, whew, the loss to Vanderbilt in Nashville. It's now back-to-back -back years that Arkansas has lost to Vanderbilt. Last year was at home, this year on the road. And what a weird and frustrating game for so many different reasons, but this time it's much different than what it has been in the previous games as well. Arkansas lose by a final score of 97 to 84. That was in regulation. 97 points Vanderbilt scored. It was the most points that any opponent has scored on Arkansas, at least in the SEC, since 2020. And now Arkansas is now one and four in SEC play. Uh, there's a lot to kind of break down here in, in this game. Like in the first half, Arkansas did a really good job of weathering the storm where they had an eight point lead heading into halftime. They were up 42 to 34. Uh, you had some guys that got into foul trouble early for Vanderbilt. You had the whole situation where uh, so you had technicals assessed. You had some ejections there because uh, Mignon, I think is his name, he Ezra Mignon, he got ejected after getting double technicals. You also had uh, uh, Jerry Stackhouse get a technical too. And there was a lot of uh, chippiness in this game for whatever reason. I think a lot of it had to do with, uh, you know, just kind of the way it was being called or at least the, things that some of the players were doing that they were getting away with in the beginning because Doug Shiles, the officials and their great crew uh, didn't really nip it in the bud at the very beginning. And then it just kind of boiled over to where technicals were assessed. Also, Kamani Johnson had a technical in this game too. But I saw something in the first half, which I've never seen before, where you had Arkansas take seven free throws on one trip because of the technicals and because of the and one thing that Anthony Black got, you had seven free throws taken. So, that was kind of the weirdness of this game. And Arkansas, you know, did not as great against the, in the free throws, but they still were, they were, had great opportunities in the first half to really have that game and then make it work in the second half. But the problem with this team really all year long has always been the offense, at least in conference play. They haven't been able to score effectively. They haven't been able to hit shots, especially open shots. Seem like a lot of times they're lost offensively. Well, in this game, that was not the case because Arkansas scored 84 points, 84 points. They scored 42 points in the first half and 42 points in the second half. They shot nearly 50% from the field. They shot 39% from three-point land, which is honestly really good considering where they've been all season long. They were hit seven threes. Their free throws were not great. They shot 15 of 24, but still uh, it was, at least with the shooting and the, and the field goals and the three-pointers, you did a good enough job to win this game. And if you score 84 points against any SEC opponent, you should win the game. But the difference in this game became the second half with Vanderbilt and the way that they shot. They did not miss in this game. All right. Or at least in the second half. You had a situation where Vanderbilt in the second half shot nearly 70% from the field, 66% from three point land, and 91% from free throw. All right. They went six of nine from three. They made in this game 10 three pointers. 10 three pointers in this game. Went 10 of 18. That's 55%. 30 points strictly off free throws. 50, yeah. So 30 points off of three pointers. 
You had 29 points off of free throws because they hit 29 of 36 free throws, had 21 of them in the second half, and that was the difference in this game. Arkansas didn't turn the ball over a whole lot. They had a, a good amount of assists as far as uh, 11 assists, 11 turnovers. That's one-to-one. One. It's not great, but still, it's not horrible. Arkansas had 15 offensive rebounds in this game and got 14 second chance point or 16 second chance points. So that's really good compared to what it was the last game. Offensively, there was nothing wrong with this game for Arkansas. It just came down to defense, and Arkansas's defense completely and totally collapsed in the second half, which was such a weird thing to see. Now, I said this to a lot of people when uh, discussions were being had as far as you know, what went wrong in the game. And a lot of Rage Rec fans were fired up and angry and frustrated and mad, which that's just what they're going to do after a loss. But even if you're just playing average defense, for a team to go in and shoot like Vanderbilt did in the second half, that's not a common thing. It's not. like it, Even if Arkansas was playing average defense, which I think they were about playing average defense, they do that against a lot of other opponents. And even then, they don't make as many shots as what Vanderbilt did. Vanderbilt's not a great team. They're not a great shooting team. They're not a good offensive team. But you're going to have those games in conference play or just in college basketball in general where a team is just not going to miss. And then when you couple that with some of the poor defensive plays that Arkansas made, they're going to make you pay in a major way. Vanderbilt scored 63 points in the second half. 63 points. You know, there's been games where Arkansas hasn't scored 63 points in a game this year. They scored 63 points in the second half. So really frustrating. A lot of chippiness, a lot of things that were boiling over. And honestly, to me, this was the type of game that was the worst timed game. If Vanderbilt plays like they did in the first half, in the second half, Arkansas wins this game going away. Like Arkansas wins this game probably by 15, 20 points. But that's not what happened. It's just bad timing because Arkansas so desperately needed this win to kind of get things back on track and especially to win some. Like you're not going to have a lot of easy games. Vanderbilt's not a good basketball team that you should beat every single time, and you didn't. So now you're sitting at one and four in conference play when you feel like you should be at least two and three. You were counting on it, but it's just like if this game would have happened later in the year against some other opponent, I think it changes everything. And I think it makes everything like not better, but I think people chalk it up to, hey, those games are going to happen, especially if you were winning and doing a lot better leading into it. But because you had already lost a few games and then this game happens, that's what makes it to where you're just throwing up your arms. You're like, how, how does this work? Because Arkansas's defense has always been the problem. Our offense has always been the problem, but it wasn't in this case. It was the opposite. So now you're just uh, you're in a funk, and it's not going to get easier. No one's going to feel sorry for you. You have a target on your back. Most teams in this conference, they seem to really hate you and to hate Arkansas. I've definitely noticed this, and uh, that's just the kind of the way where I'm like, okay, well, I guess we're just going to have to deal with it that way too. But uh, I'll say this. like, I, If you want some silver linings or maybe if you want some reasons to be hopeful, you know, maybe some of you don't want to hear it. Maybe some of you don't want to hear about it. You don't care about it. You're moving on, whatever it is. That's fine. But my thing is, is I, I just feel like this was not, if this game would have been a game where Arkansas lost 61 to 54 and they lost because of how poor their offense was once again, then I think I would be a lot more upset. I think I would be a lot more frustrated and also uh, a lot more discouraged going forward. But because of the fact that it was just Arkansas's offense played really well compared to what they have so far in SEC play, and it was just Vanderbilt could not miss in the second half on top of Arkansas's defense kind of taking a step back, I'm hoping that this is more of just the exception, not the rule. This was a different type of game. College basketball is going to have these games. Like, there's going to be a game this year, I guarantee it, in conference play that Arkansas is going to not be able to miss. Like, they're just going to catch fire. Hopefully, it happens very soon. And hopefully, it happens against a really good team. But, you know, last year, I think about it, I think it was Arkansas when they played Georgia on the road. Arkansas scored like 99 points against Georgia on the road. Georgia wasn't a great team, but Arkansas just could not miss, especially in the second half. Those games are just going to happen. And so that's why I feel like it might be okay. It should be okay. Arkansas can still do some really good things moving forward, but I, I understand the frustrations that fans have right now. But I also want to say, though, that it, it's insane to me how fans were, like, I get, like, you're reactionary. I get that, you know, you, you get emotional, especially in these games, but some of you just got to relax. Like, the amount of people that were saying that 
Eric Musselman is like he's he's not the coach. He's not disciplined. People were saying that, uh, you know, like there's a person that tweeted uh, me a picture of Chad Morris's face on Eric Musselman's body, which I blocked that person. That ain't happening. Like, I don't block people on Twitter, but I block that nonsense. Like, people are doing that. People were saying that, uh, you know, no one asked those tough questions to Muss because everyone's just spinning positivity. Like, all that stuff. It's just really insane. It's it's insane to me, and it's disappointing how many people just, like, we're already moved on to baseball, too. Like, uh, bring on baseball season. You know, okay, good luck with that. Like, I, I want, I've saved, I wanted to save all, a lot of those tweets, so just so I can, like, go back and if Arkansas turns this around like they have in previous years, just go and be like, all right, y'all are not allowed to root for the Razorbacks in the same way. No, you, you bounced, you bounced off. You're ready for baseball season. You got to move on, not dealing with that. So I, I probably won't do that actually, but still that's what I, I feel like. So many Razorback fans are just so reactionary in this. Just relax, take it easy, take a deep breath. There's a lot of games left. Are they, are they going to be a number one seed? Like a lot of us were hoping doesn't look like it. Can they still get to the tournament? Absolutely. They can. And once they get there, all bets are off. And once Nick Smith gets back, which I still believe he will be, that's going to help this team a lot in different ways. So just relax. Let's see how it goes. They still got some games, but if it doesn't get any better, if they start continuing to lose in the clip that they're losing, yeah, it's going to be uh, pretty frustrating and pretty uh, pretty nasty, no doubt about it, and especially among Razorback fans. I want to talk to you a little bit more about football next year's schedule here in just a second, though. But first, betonline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. So you get all the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season to basketball, World Cup. They've got it all at betonline.net. So if you love sports podcasts, you can even find those at BetOnline as well. They're the fastest and easiest way to get on all your betting info. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more over at BetOnline, where the game starts. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Okay, so final segment of the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I want to clear something up that uh, I had tweeted but also talked about because people were coming after me about me discussing next year's football schedule and why I think it's the easiest football schedule that Arkansas has had in quite some time. And uh, some people brought up, it's like, well, first off, though, you don't, can't say that it's not you're, you're, it's not an easy schedule. I'm like, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's the easiest, which is still showing that it's really difficult. But when it comes to previous years, it's definitely a lot easier. Now, I will agree, though, that Arkansas for sure had easier schedules in 20, uh, 2018 and 2019 when Chad Morris was here. The problem is, is that you had an idiot for a coach. That it didn't matter what your schedule looked like, you were going to lose the majority of those games. And that's what's unfortunate. So I'm comboing this with Arkansas and also uh, the team that they're going to have going up against uh, an easier schedule, making it to feel like it's much easier. Because in 2018, like you had East Illinois, Eastern Illinois, Colorado State, North Texas, and Tulsa. Those are your non conference games. You had the SEC, but you had your East opponent that you played was Vanderbilt. With Derek Mason at home. Man, should have been a lot easier than what it was, right? But uh, that, that was easier. And then the next year in 2019, I know it doesn't matter about 20, I mean, because you went two and 10, but you had Portland State, Colorado State, San Jose State, and also Western Kentucky as your non conference opponents. And then you had at Kentucky being your uh, East opponent. And yeah, yeah, great. So that I get like, though people are going to bring up that schedule, say, hey, that schedule's easier. And I'm like, okay. You're right in that regard, but I am talking about looking at uh, the quality of team listed with the opponents, and Arkansas does have an easier stretch because Western Carolina, Kent State, BYU, as well as FIU should all be games you win. They're all at home as well. And then you have at LSU, which is going to be tough, especially in September. Whereas I don't know, and that may be better for Arkansas. Maybe LSU uh, plays their better football towards the end of the season. Who knows? But, you know, you, you have that game. That's going to be tough no matter what. You go to Alabama, it's going to be tough. But a and it's a crapshoot. You never know. That game's weird. At Ole Miss, they don't scare me. Mississippi State at home, you know, new coach that is unproven, so don't really know what they're going to do. At Florida, they got major issues, so I don't think Florida's going to be much of a factor. Auburn at home will be interesting because Hugh Freeze, I could see him being really good in the first year, but I also could see them be having some problems there in the first year too. So that one's a TBD. But – yeah, Missouri at home, which you better win that game. So my point is, is like, 
I'm not saying it's easy as in you'll just blow through it and be no problems at all. But compared to this this past year and the year before that, in the year before that, this is this is Sam Pittman's easiest schedule he's had, and it's still hard. But it's the easiest schedule he's had since he's been the head coach at Arkansas. So that's all I'm saying. They got a lot of room. They got a lot of room for improvement. They got some road trips, especially in the fact that uh, during next year's schedule, you don't play again in Fayetteville for a month, over a month. You go from September 16th against BYU is in Fayetteville, and then your next game in Fayetteville is against Mississippi State on October 21st. So, yeah, you're talking about uh, over a month until between home games. So that's going to be a huge and tricky thing, but I'll take this schedule over this past year or the year before the year before schedule any day of the week. Appreciate everybody listening into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at Buzz John Neighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.